thank you all for uh, being here. I'm doing this for two reasons. One is that I love the subject matter. Uh, of course, it's not controversial at all. <laughs> uh, and the other reason I'm doing it is because I'll be on leave next semester and there is no law and religion course being offered. So this is, if you will, a kind of uh, primer on the religion clauses and where we are today. Now, the focus uh, with respect to cases is on two very recent and controversial decisions, Town of Greece and Hobby Lobby. My goal here is to situate these two cases both theoretically and jurisprudentially. Uh, much of what I'm going to say is going to be descriptive, but not all of it, because my views will emerge uh, either through my presentation or in the question and answer segment or in both. So let's, let's begin. The first part of the First Amendment, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, followed, as you all know, by the speech, press, and other uh, clauses. There are two major purposes of the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause. One is to protect government from religion because religion is ultimately based on faith, what's sometimes called passion, while self-government is supposed to be based on reason and practical judgment. The European and probably worldwide historical experience and the theory is that faith and passion distort and inevitably corrupt government, recall the divine right of kings, and are a danger to it. Now, a second, less, re less often remarked on purpose of the Establishment Clause in particular is to protect religion from government, which is, of course, a major purpose of the Free Exercise Clause, as we'll see later. If one religion captures government, other religions are in danger. More subtly, and especially uh, in connection with government financial support of religion, religious bodies, and even for-profit corporations sometimes, see Hobby Lobby, uh, sometimes find themselves having to comply with governmental conditions that may be inconsistent with their religious beliefs, call that behavior modification or bribery for tuition. Now let's jump right into the Establishment Clause. There are two very different approaches to the Establishment Clause. The one, the famous one, is Jefferson's Wall <coughs> of Separation Metaphor, set out in 1802 to the Danbury, in his letter to the Danbury Baptist Association. Madison, the draftsman of the Bill of Rights, agreed. See his memorial and remonstrance and their joint support of the Virginia bill mandating religious freedom. This is the Enlightenment model that emphasizes the private-public <coughs> distinction in connection with religion, even though many religions don't buy into that particular distinction. That's one, uh, if you will, uh, approach to the religion clauses and particularly the establishment clause. There is a second approach to the Establishment Clause, which is more prominent these days, especially in the Supreme Court. That is a morality-based accommodation model, which was supported, interestingly enough, by George Washington and John Adams to oversimplify their position. They thought governments required citizens uh, who, uh, had, uh, who were morally grounded, and religion was a very good way, perhaps the best way, of supplying that moral ground. But all of them, whether they were strict separationists or whether they were accommodationists, bought into the principle of neutrality, which meant at the very <coughs> least that government could not prefer any particular religion over others. The core principle of the Establishment Clause that there could be no government church, there could be no direct financial support of churches. So the overall question under the Establishment Clause uh, is what is the proper role of religion in the public square? 
there have been three historically controversial areas in Supreme Court Establishment Clause jurisprudence. And I'm here setting the stage for the town of Greece. The first area is prayer, especially school prayer, but including, as we know, legislative prayer. A second controversial area, school funding, uh, aid to students in religious schools, aid directly to religious schools, and school vouchers. And the third particularly controversial area under the Establishment Clause is governmental or religious displays. Crushes, menorahs, Ten Commandments, and crosses. It is fair to say that in the last two decades especially, the move in the Supreme Court has been to greater governmental accommodation of religion in the areas of school funding and government <coughs> religious displays. Separation has for the most part held firm in connection with school prayer, but in light of town of Greece, the move to governmental accommodation is clear in other public <coughs> prayer situations involving adults. These are, doctrinally at least, the results of changes in the prevailing establishment clause tests, which I'll briefly discuss next. Of course, being realists, as we all are, personnel changes in the Supreme Court are perhaps a more direct cause, as, for example, Justice O'Connor's being replaced by Justice Alito. That was, Alito, that was a game changer in this area. So here are the three tests that everybody needs to know a little bit about. The heretofore dominant lemon test, lemon versus Kurtzman. Uh, governmental and uh, conduct under the Establishment Clause in order to be constitutional <coughs> must serve a secular purpose. Its primary effect must be neither to advance nor to establish, uh, or excuse me, neither to advance nor inhibit religion. And then there was uh, an entanglement prong, which is no longer with us, but it uh, took into account the extent to which government and religion were entangled with one another. And the Lemon Test goes back to 1971, and it dealt with aid to religious schools. This is a very government-restrictive test. This is pretty obvious, isn't it? Particularly in school prayer cases, because the purpose in these kinds of situations is pretty clearly religious. But it is also quite a restrictive test in aid to religious school cases. Because, and, and religious display cases because the effect in both of those situations was often found to be to advance uh, religion. Not surprisingly, given the changes in personnel and culture in the Supreme Court, Lemon has been extensively criticized by various justices in the so-called conservative majority on the court, and indeed was not used, as we shall see, by anyone in the town of Greece case. There is a second test under the Establishment Clause, Justice O'Connor's endorsement test, which was, is, a less government-restrictive test initially developed in connection with religious displays, Lynch v. Donnelly, the crash case, handed down in 1984. And this test is, uh, can be put this way, whether a reasonable observer conversant with history and tradition would view the government conduct as an endorsement of religion by the government. There's a lot of play in the joints uh, under this test. It was used a bit, as we'll see, in the town of Greece case. The third test, which has become uh, particularly prominent uh, since Justice Kennedy became a swing justice in so many five to four decisions of the Supreme Court, is his coercion test uh, that arose in 1992 in Lee versus Weissman. It's a middle school graduation case in which for the court he emphasized psychological coercion as against the legal coercion of compulsory school attendance because technically students did not have to attend their middle school graduation. This is uh, a very permissive government uh, test under the Establishment Clause, particularly outside of the context of school prayer and is applied to adults, as demonstrated by the town of Greece case itself. Finally, we're getting to the town of Greece. I've thrown a lot at you, but here is the town of Greece case. 
Suppose an overwhelmingly Christian town, over a period of a decade or so, regularly invites Christian clergymen to lead the opening prayers in town board meetings. Suppose also that these clergymen, more often than not, invoke Jesus and or the Holy Ghost in their prayers, and that typically everyone, including members of the public, mostly adults, in attendance on various business matters, is asked to stand, bow his or her head, or join in the prayer, which most, but not all of them, do. At the same time, the town, after protests from uh, non-Christians, including several Jews, invites a few others, including non-Christian clergy, to lead the opening prayer, which is done for a very short time, a few months, after which the town reverts to past practice, in part because the town's places of worship are all Christian and because it is easier. Does this pattern violate the established the Second Circuit in Galloway held that it did, it did violate the Established Clause. And let me read this. What we hold is that a legislative prayer practice that, however well-intentioned, conveys to a reasonable objective observer under the totality of the circumstances an official affiliation with a particular religion violates the clear command of the Establishment Clause. Note that the Second Circuit used Justice O'Connor's endorsement test in holding that the Establishment Clause was violated. Significantly, the Second Circuit didn't use Justice Kennedy's coercion test. However, and this is going to be important for Tom and Greece purposes, the Second Circuit did discuss and distinguish the Supreme Court's 1983 decision, the legislative prayer decision in Marsh versus Chambers, the only case in which the validity of legislative prayer had ever been considered by the Supreme Court before Tom of Greece. Here, the court ruled that the Nebraska legislature's practice of opening its sessions with a prayer delivered by a state employed clergyman, no less, did not violate the Establishment Clause. The court used an historical approach to interpreting the Establishment Clause, emphasizing that the framers themselves, by their practice in Congress at the very beginning of our government, did not view legislative prayers led by government employed clergy as violations of the Establishment Clause. In addition, and importantly, the court in March noted the Judeo-Christian content of the prayers, uh, and that this content did not establish religion because the prayers did not proselytize, did not advance any religion, or disparage any religion. It was on this basis that the Second Circuit distinguished the Marsh case in the town of Greece case. The Supreme Court, not surprisingly, granted cert and gave the answer to the Establishment Clause question that most of us, including me, expected. A 5 to 4 decision reversing the Second Circuit was handed down on May 5, 2014. Justice Kennedy wrote for the court and he emphasized March and its reliance on tradition. He rejected the argument that Marsh was distinguishable because overtly Christian prayers were not involved here. In his view, this was insignificant and irrelevant to the court's reasoning in Marsh. He disavowed dicta to the contrary in later cases about this limiting interpretation of Marsh. Furthermore, not only did the prayers involved here fall within the tradition of Marsh, but it was important that the town maintain a policy of non-discrimination. As an alternative ground, joined only by Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Alito, there was no coercion here because adults were voluntarily present at the town meeting, in contrast to Lee versus Weissman with its psychological coercion of middle school children. And importantly, just because adults might have, some adults might have been offended by the predominantly Christian prayers, that was not enough to constitute coercion. Now, Justices Scalia and Thomas did not join in the coercion part, but otherwise agreed with Justice Kennedy's reasoning about Marsh and uh, tradition. Their view on coercion is that only legal coercion matters, period, and not psychological coercion. <clears throat> Justice Kagan wrote an impassioned dissent, arguing that Marsh was distinguishable because here, unlike in Marsh, the prayer was not explicitly Christian. Moreover, in Marsh, 
The prayer was primarily for legislators, whereas here, the prayer was not only for local legislators, but also involved uh, citizens who had to be there to conduct business with the town. She made a very interesting point to me, at least, when she used a functional approach and maintained that town meetings perform not only legislative functions, but also adjudicative and executive functions as well. And she gave a series of hypotheticals uh, setting out uh, fact patterns in which citizens participate. <clears throat> Finally, she chastised the majority of obvious blindness to other religions, obvious in her view, and their adherence, and its, sensi its insensitivity to what citizenship means. There are some observations, uh, my observations about town meetings, before we get into the, the exercise. No justice in the town of Greece relied on the Latin text, including the dissenters. So in the public prayer setting, perhaps excluding school prayer, it, it appears to be effectively dead. And this seems also to be the case for its use in education, in aid to education, and religious display cases. Justice O'Connor's endorsement test after town of Greece is probably inapplicable to public prayer cases as well, although it seems to retain its currency in the religious display cases. Town of Greece continues the court's determined march in the direction of an increasing governmental role in accommodating religion in the public square. And finally, with respect to Town of Greece, consider the fact that all of the justices in the majority <coughs> are Catholics, and therefore Christians, while three of the four dissenters are Jewish, so Justice Sotomayor is a Catholic. What does this suggest, if anything, about blindness to minority religions in the Establishment Clause setting? What does it suggest, if anything, about the effect of a justice's religion on his or her view of the Establishment Clause, at least for this court? Questions, questions, but not sure of the answer. So that's the first part of my talk, bringing you up to speed on the establishment. <laughs> and in 10 or 15 maximum minutes, we're going to do uh, the free exercise clause. And even more, as I suggested earlier, even more than the establishment clause, the free exercise clause has as its primary purpose the protection of religious minorities and religious beliefs and activities. Even though Establishment Clause jurisprudence really began, for the most part, in the second half of the 20th century, Free Exercise Clause jurisprudence began in 1879, involving Mormons. The Reynolds case in 1879, which upheld the conviction of uh, a Mormon for bigamy, in which the court, where the court drew a distinction that reigned for decades between governmental regulation of, of conduct and governmental regulation <coughs> of belief. The government could regulate conduct under the Reynolds approach, even if it burden religious uh, behavior, but beliefs were a different matter. That changed in 1963 with Sherbert versus Werner. Uh, many of you know about different kinds of tests under various constitutional provisions. The most deferential test is a rational basis or conceivable rational basis test. The least deferential test is a kind of per se invalidity or somewhat, sh somewhat short of that, strict scrutiny. And strict scrutiny, as most of you know, involves an inquiry into two things. Is, did the does the government have, a, did the government have a compelling interest in what it did? And if it did, were, was the means that the government used either narrowly tailored or the least restrictive means that the government could have used. It places a very heavy burden of justification on government. Notice in Reynolds, 
the court seemed to use a kind of rational basis approach in 1879 before those <coughs> terms were these terms were invented, drawing that distinction between conduct and uh, belief. But in Sherbert versus Verner, it was an unemployment compensation case whose facts uh, need not occupy us now. Justice Brennan for the court said, you know what? In free exercise clause cases, if the if religious behavior is burdened significantly, <clears throat> then we will use strict scrutiny. I'll say that again. Sherbert Verner, strict scrutiny. If governmental, uh, if, if religious behavior is burdened by otherwise neutral governmental regulation, <coughs> it triggers strict scrutiny, and the court used strict scrutiny under the Free Exercise Clause both in this case, in Sherbert, and a few years later uh, in 1972 in Wisconsin versus Yoder, the compulsory education case going beyond eighth grade, in which, in which the Amish were given an exemption from that requirement. And that gives me the opportunity to say something that's obvious, but I'll say it anyway. When a free exercise clause claim is made, that person or group is asking for an exemption from a generally applicable regulation or rule of conduct. The exercise claim is, an, is a request for an exemption for a generally from a generally applicable law, whether civil or criminal. Now, after uh, Sherbert and after Yoder, uh, there were ebbs and flows in Supreme Court free exercise clause jurisprudence. There was an Air Force Yamaki case, Goldman in 1986, which ruled against uh, the Air Force uh, officer who wanted to wear a Yamaki, a uh, very discreet one, but wanted to wear a Yamaki while on the job. And the Ling case involving governmental access to Native American sacred property. In both those cases, uh, the challenger under the free exercise clause uh, lost. Which brings us finally, well not so finally, but brings us to the peyote case. Uh, the Smith case, which my con law students uh, will affectionately remember from a couple of days ago, uh, because it ties into the city of Bernie. But in this case, the Supreme Court dealt with this particular question. There was a generally applicable criminal statute prohibiting the ingestion of peyote and the use of other drugs. Uh, Smith was fired for his drug use because he had violated this criminal law, and he was denied unemployment compensation because uh, he was discharged for work-related misconduct. The key is a generally applicable criminal statute. In a, a, an opinion by Justice Scalia, I would characterize it as a kind of revisionist opinion. He's done that before in other situations and will do this again uh, in the future. Justice Scalia repudiated for a majority the use of strict scrutiny in cases where there is religious behavior is burdened, even if significantly. So long as the criminal law is even-handed and does not discriminate against religion, it's fine if it has a rational basis, that very deferential standard. Rational basis or reasonableness. Interestingly enough, the Supreme Court uh, in Smith did not overrule Sherbert and did not overrule Yoder. I leave it to you to see the ingenious ways in which Justice Scalia retained those. My guess is he had to retain them, otherwise he would not have had four other justices with him. You know, a little bit of internal uh, judicial power. Keep uh, in mind the various religious rituals that could uh, theoretically at least be uh, affected by this. If a state were to prohibit uh, circumcisions, except by medical professionals in a hospital, that would have 
that would place quite a burden on observant Jews and Muslims. Is there a rational basis for such? You betcha there is. The health of the baby boy. Would it survive under Smith? You betcha it would survive under Smith. What's Justice Scalia's answer to that question? It's not going to happen because of recourse uh, to the political process. These kinds of far out cases, in his view, and the view of that majority, uh, are not going to happen. Now, we are slouching towards Abilak. <laughs> Congress responded to the Smith case by enacting the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which was an in your face response, really, to the Smith case, which caused a furor, and RIFRA uh, uh, stated, as applied to state and local governments, as well as to the federal uh, government, rules of general applicability which burden, which burden religious behavior, <laughs> triggered strict scrutiny. A restoration, if you will, of the status quo ante, at least uh, as exemplified by Sherbert and Wisconsin versus uh, Yoder. So you need a compelling governmental interest and the least restrictive means. As many of you know, at least as applied to state and local governments, this was found by the Supreme Court to have exceeded congressional power under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment. It was constitutional law making rather than just remedial in nature. So we put that to the side, and we end up with RIFRA being applicable to the federal government only. Now, just to complete the picture, uh, because Hobby Lobby does deal with RIFRA in the federal government, let me uh, also point out that another response to uh, the Smith case was our LUPA, Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, which deals with zoning decisions by state and local governments, and also with institutionalized persons, particularly in prisons. These were these are valid exercises of the spending power because compliance with our LUPA and its strict scrutiny requirement uh, uh, is a condition of receiving federal funds, spending power. Now let's finally get into Hobby Lobby. Handed down last term. Uh, it's really two cases, the Hobby Lobby case involving uh, Christian owners of a privately uh, held, closely held corporation and Conestoga involving Mennonites, also owners of a uh, closely held uh, for-profit corporation. Uh, health and Human Services Regulations under the Affordable Care Act required uh, specified employer health plans to furnish preventive care and screenings for women without any cost sharing requirements. Specifically, including coverage for 20 contraceptive methods approved by the FDA, in, uh, specifically referencing four uh, IUDs involving IUDs in the morning after pill that could have an effect on preventing already fertilized eggs from developing. Religious uh, employers, churches, I'm still talking about sketching out the statute here, religious employers such as churches <coughs> were exempt from this as were, are, religious nonprofit organizations with religious objections. Under this accommodation, these folks uh, could have contraceptive coverage excluded from their plans, but the insurance issuer had to provide plan participants with payments for these contraceptive services without imposing various costs. In the Hobby Lobby case itself, uh, the owners of these closely held for-profit corporations 
sued alleging violations of RFRA, remember, ACA, federal statute, RFRA's still good with respect to the federal statute, because this requirement burdened their free exercise of religion under RFRA, because it burdened, interfered with, abridged their belief that life begins at conception. The Supreme Court held, I before, as applied to closely held for-profit corp corporations, RFRA was violated. So you know right up front, this is not a free exercise clause case as such. It is a statutory interpretation case, but obviously it smacks uh, of free exercise. Corporations, both nonprofit and profit, are persons. The purpose of extending RIFRA was to protect the rights of people associated with corporations, including shareholders, officers, and employees, and protecting the free exercise clause rights of, of closely held corporations protects religious liberty of those who uh, own and control them. Now let me run very quickly through, because I want to leave room for questions and discussion. Let me run very quickly through the, the reasoning with respect to for-profit corporations, because that has generated a lot of publicity. Prior decisions pro permitted, according to the majority, free exercise claims of not-profit corporations, <coughs> and the Health and Human Services Department conceded that nonprofits are persons under RIFRA, so how could profits, according to the court, uh, therefore be excluded from the meaning of persons? Once you concede not profits, how do you exclude profits? The court also rejected the argument that for profits can't exercise religion because free exercise clause claims uh, can be brought by individuals, the court said, uh, who are engaged in profit making. Braunfeld versus Braun, a long ago case involving a kosher butcher who challenged unsuccessfully under the free exercise clause uh, a Sunday closing law. Because that meant for him, since he observed the Saturday as a Sabbath, he would not be able to open his business for two days every weekend, and not just, uh, not just one. RIFRA goes beyond codifying pre-Smith free exercise clause precedents that didn't cover for profits. It is broader than that. Next, and these arguments were made not only by the government, by the way, that the majority is rejecting, uh, but also by the dissent. The fear of expansion to large for-profit publicly, tra publicly traded corporations was vastly overblown. No such has applied for RIFRA yet, and if it happens, state corporate law can be resorted to. In any event, this case is narrow because it applies only to closely held uh, corporation uh, involved and members of a single family. Now let's get to the application of strict scrutiny quickly and we can get into our discussion. There is, under strict scrutiny, a substantial burden imposed on the owners of these two closely held for-profit corporations because the requirement that they provide contraceptive services for <coughs> kinds of people seriously violates their religious belief that life begins at conception. If they refuse, if they refuse under the statute, the regs to provide these services, there would be millions of dollars per year uh, spent by them uh, penalties and otherwise depending on the size of their business. And if they, if they drop coverage of insurance altogether, they would not only suffer a competitive disadvantage, but there were certain penalties, $2,000 per employee that would kick in. And the majority in Hobby Lobby also rejected the argument that it's kind of a proximate cause argument. Who is deciding to use contraceptives? It's women, some of whom may decide to get those. There is a proximate cause disconnect, if you will, between the decision to 
have insurance available for these services and the decision of these women to get the contraceptive uh, services. So the argument was made that this was too attenuated because the employee gets the coverage. And the Supreme Court's answer was uh, interesting, not terribly satisfying. It said it's not for the Supreme Court to determine this particular moral issue for employers. Interesting. The court assumed that there was a compelling governmental interest uh, to provide these services. But it went directly to the question of least restrictive means and said that there were least res less restrictive means available. The government itself could assume the costs of these four uh, of these four kinds of contraceptives for women, or could extend the same accommodation uh, here as it did for religious nonprofit organizations. Okay? And then it poo pooed the concern that after Hobby Lobby, uh, you know, what would happen if for profit corporations did not, on religious clause grounds or RIFRA grounds, did not want to pay for vaccinations or blood transfusions? Here are my comments finally on Hobby Lobby, and then we'll get into questions. As I said before, but I want to reemphasize, the free exercise clause issue is not reached here in the Hobby Lobby. Statutory only. Is there some implication that a free exercise clause challenge might have been successful? Maybe, but then the Smith case would be an obstacle because, remember, unless there's discrimination against religion, you use rational basis review. Just a question. The court, not only did the, did the court do this, but Kennedy, Justice Kennedy, his concurring opinion, emphasized that this was a narrow decision, despite the assertion in Justice Ginsburg's dissent that this was a decision of startling breadth with significant burdens on third parties, namely thousands of women employed by these employers. For Ginsburg and other dissenters, this case was all about women and <coughs> contraceptives. And with respect to the least restrictive means, she said, letting the government pay has no end point at all. The court has, in Hobby Lobby, entered a mine field. The real question after Hobby Lobby is whether and to what extent it's going to be expanded. Finally, as in Town of Greece, five justices uh, have a view of the proper role of religion in public life that uh, this view is very different from the view of the other four justices. So these two cases have a piece of a piece, even though they deal with different religion clauses, establishment, and if you will, indirectly free exercise. And there you have it. A little over a half hour, but uh, I've thrown a lot at you, but we're open to any questions uh, that you might have. I, I, I think I'm assigned the responsibility to moderate. Any questions? Please, start us off, Professor. Okay. Uh, first question is, why do you think that Kagan and Breyer declined to go into part of uh, Ginsburg's dissent about for-profit corporations being persons under RIFRA? Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. I don't know. Do you have any thoughts about that? I do not. Because you teach, uh, you're much more familiar with corporate law than I do. Uh, mm -hmm. no. I don't know about that. Uh, <laughs> then I am. Question, go okay. ahead. The second question is, uh, in pre-employment versus Smith doctrine, how did the court draw the line between kind of the substantiality of the burden and the sincerity of the belief? Because Ginsburg's dissent makes a lot of hay out of that distinction, uh, but I think it's hard to draw that line. I think it's very hard to draw the line also. In the Hobby Lobby case, there's a kind of conflation between the financial penalties that Hobby Lobby and Conestogo will have to incur if they don't comply, 
and the sincerity of religious belief. One of the arguments that Justice Ginsburg and the dissenters raised against the majority's view about sincerity was that nobody is questioning sincerity, uh, but it uh, should not be the role of the court to inquire into that at all. Uh, the financial burden is really the major consideration and not sincerity. So you got the financial burden there, even though some of the dissenters say there really wasn't. Um, well, Justin, do you think that a lot of the coming cases that will challenge or try to expand on this will more be citing the actual decision by the majority, or will they be citing uh, Justice Ginsburg's dissent to kind of go, look, Ginsburg clearly thinks this is an opening, opening a door. Why can't we go explore that? Or will more people kind of try to stick with the narrowly tailored decision? Majority. Well, when you say people, are you referring to litigants? Because litigants, you know, in these kinds of cases in the future are going to uh, rely on whatever they can to make their arguments. If you were to put that question very generally, would you, as a litigant, would you, as an advocate, would you rely on a majority opinion or a dissent? The answer is pretty obvious, isn't it? But that's what they're going to be jockeying about. On the other hand, Hobby Lobby is very clear. Uh, the question is, what is its scope beyond these kinds of closely held for-profit corporations? It's a tough one, because you would think the initial question is, can for-profit corporations exercise religion? And the court's answer is that it's not that they are exercising religion, it's that they are owners of these closely held corporations are the ones who are exercising religion. It's almost uh, like an instrumental approach. We're not doing this in order to protect you know, for-profit corporations. We are doing this in order to protect their owners, especially if they are small for-profit, closely held corporations. So it seems to me that's one of the fault lines, uh, you know, one of the uh, places where there is a fair amount of wiggle room. Please. Um, so I'm interested in hearing how you think um, the RIPPER analysis will play out in some of the coming cases, especially the ones brought by the religious nonprofits and their uh, belief that the accommodation extended to them is itself a violation of uh, the statute. It's going to be tricky to predict that. You know? uh, can you be even more concrete? In your question, I mean, what is, uh, I mean, based upon what we were just saying a moment ago, uh, is sincerity of belief alone? I would say you really do need to show some sort of significant uh, burden there. Right. So the argument I think they, they're going to try to make is that you know by signing this form or somehow starting the chain that eventually leads to these people getting contracts at all. That is itself a burden. And the question is whether that really plays out. Well, that doesn't, just signing the form itself doesn't persuade me, very frankly. Uh, but it may persuade some of the justices. Sanford? No, I was just, yeah, I was. You're to respond to that? Please jump in. Actually, I was just going to try to uh, add the clarification that the uh, gentleman from the church just added. But didn't, didn't the court, a few days after, yes. handed down Hobby Lobby? Yeah issue, uh, not a, an opinion, but a state. It was a state, which is that, what is that, being referred right, to. That suggested um, that it was not necessarily going to stick to the line it had drawn in the case, yeah. which, which evoked a very um, vociferous uh, comment from one or more of the Correct. Uh, of course, in real world terms, <coughs> we do not yet know how that's going to play out, doctrinally. <coughs> We don't know whether that's going to turn out to be uh, uh, a doctrinal decision or whether since it's a stay, temporary, you know, justices for various reasons enter stays that might or might not foreshadow the ultimate outcome. Stays are ways of maintaining the status quo by definition. So I don't know what the answer is going to be. But on the merits of that, I don't think signing a form is enough. You talk about an attenuated connection which the court rejected in you know, the argument in the Hobby Lobby case, signing 
a form. I'm not quite sure how that plays out. Has uh, the town of Greece changed its practice at all since the town of Greece decision came down? You suggested that the, that the town officials were focused largely on the Christian community. Uh, and I was wondering if any um, uh, Wiccans have stepped up to offer uh, a witch's prayer at, uh, at these town meetings to challenge the, the goal of well, the court in Town of Greece uh, pointed out that there was an attempt made, however short-lived it was. I uh, see all the religious institutions, that is, all of the places of worship in Town of Greece are Christian. So there would be, uh, you'd have to go outside the town uh, to get uh, Jewish or and other kinds of clergymen. But the Supreme Court gave its imprimatur to what the town of Greece had done and said explicitly we're not going to impose uh, unduly burdensome obligations on the town of Greece to do more than it did, so long as it did not discriminate on the basis of religion. Uh, that's all that was necessary. In fact, it had made those efforts. So, so far as I know, I haven't followed up. Uh, I doubt that, well, if I'm advising the town of Greece, uh, afterwards, I would say, look, you dodged a bullet here. Uh, why don't you make a bit more of an effort to go outside and get some other clergymen on a, a kind of regular basis, maybe once every couple of months or something of that sort. That's what I would do in real world terms because litigation costs money. And why would one want to be sued again? That, that's my, but I don't know. Do you happen to know, Jerry? What? No, 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 I, no I don't. Yeah. Um, just kind of answering that. Interestingly enough, they invited an atheist to come give an invocation, um, and he did. He was he actually gave it, and it's recorded. It's online. But they've considered um, now going back to their original policy uh, because they feel that not allowing atheists to give invocations doesn't discriminate on the basis of. You mean during this period when they responded to some protests and invited some Jewish clergymen and uh, others, there were atheists? No, actually. At least one atheist invited. Actually, following the decision, um, they did as a, I think, a show of good faith. Which makes sense. Now, the question is how long does one atheist pray to last? <laughs> it was, uh, it was Forever, perhaps. <laughs> about three minutes long. <laughs> That's not what I mean. <laughs> I meant in terms of a credit to the town of Greece, but I like your response as well. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. So uh, in these establishment clause cases, you made a good point that what matters almost more than anything else is the choice of text. Um, and yet the court has sort of allowed these three tests, coercion, endorsement, and the lemon test, to coexist in nature, even though the lemon test is for all practical purposes. Um, is it already guidance about why, if, for example, in town of Greece, the origin test is more appropriate than the endorsement test? Um, or what, what is the rationale that distinguishes this case from prior cases? Um, the rationale in real politic terms is that Kennedy was the fifth justice. Well, I, I Kennedy, no, and Kennedy wrote Lee versus Weissman, mm -hmm. which was the, co the coercion of middle school graduation children. And he's going to write the opinion the way he wants to write it. And that's why a couple of the justices uh, did not join, even though they agreed with the result, did not join in. Keep in mind that you didn't really need coercion because you could have just relied on the Marsh case, which raises a very deep question. That's the legislative prayer case. Is it possible that <clears throat> Those who were around when the Bill of Rights was ratified, you know, near the first Congress, that they got it wrong. Is it possible that by uh, having a, a, a chaplain, a chaplain, who was creation in the House of Representatives, the Senate, they were wrong. They goofed. So it raises a very deep question about the 
role of tradition and what the founders did, not what they said, you know, it's what they did. And what they did seems directly contrary to uh, the Establishment Clause and its history. But my guess is, and here's something that uh, many uh, of you may know already, you know, many of the framers were deists. I hope some of you know the difference between a deist and a theist. A theist is one who believes that God uh, plays a role or watches all of us in everyday events. God intervenes in history. A deist, and a bunch of them were deists, said, uh-huh, God doesn't intervene in history. God created the world. God created the universe. Uh, set up the rules, and the rules kicked in, and that's the end of it. So major theological difference between deists and theists, and many of the framers were deists. Perhaps one of the most famous, although he might not be a framer, was Thomas Paine. He was a deist. And Jefferson, if he was not an atheist, was almost surely a deist. The clockmaker analogy. So uh, that means that you can choose among the framers whom you want to buy into for purposes of a lot of constitutional interpretation in general, and specifically with respect to the Establishment Clause and uh, the Free Exercise Clause. Now, let me say, I don't know how much time we have, but let me just at least tell you a little something about my views. I am a strict separationist. I am a strict separationist because of history. I am a strict separationist because uh, while religion can and often is life-affirming, life-giving, gives meaning to one's life, it is a double-edged sword. And should not be involved at all in governmental decision making. This is not to say that religious values, which are also independently supported, uh, should not play a role in governmental decision making. But uh, to me, it is uh, quite scary indeed. And here is my own, here I'm getting really personal, I'm going to give you my litmus test for religions, uh, many of which, some of which, are characterized by two features. One is universalism. I'm wary of any religion that says, my religion is for everyone, including you. Can you persuade? Sure that often has a tendency to lead into coercion and the threat of the use of force. The other thing I look for in a religion that makes me feel comfortable is whether it is triumphalist. Not only uh, is universalism a concern, but the triumphalist approach is, guess what? We are going to win. In one way or the other, you are going to be our religion. And you can see the dangers in that. Now, by saying those kinds of things, I have raised questions about some of the Western religions in particular. So be it. But that explains, uh, to some of you at least, why I am very, very leery of religion in government. And let me say this as well. Um, I think one of the major adverse consequences uh, uh, of the perhaps rise of religion in the public square in the last 20 years is that it has begun to permeate, maybe not begun, it has permeated political behavior. These days, I have found it is hard to engage in a rational political discussion with anybody. It's almost as if I am discussing religion in faith. And that scares me a great uh, deal. Is that only at the national level? Well, we see it in Congress, certainly. 
boy, I have seen this in personal discussion. Maybe I ought to hang around with different people. Maybe I ought to hang around more with, with you than I do with my other, uh, with my other friends. But I'm, I'm very concerned uh, about that. Let me uh, read you something. Uh, it's from the Everson case. And with this, we may be finished. It's your call. Um, history. This is the 1947 Everson case involving uh, the Establishment Clause and boards of uh, education. A large proportion of the early settlers of this country came here from Europe to escape the bondage of laws, which compelled them to support and attend government-favored churches. The centuries immediately before, and contemporaneous with the colonization of America, had been filled with turmoil, civil strife, and persecutions, generated in large part by established sects determined to maintain their absolute political and religious supremacy. With the power of government supporting them at various times and places, Catholics had persecuted Protestants, Protestants had persecuted Catholics, Protestant sects had persecuted other Protestant sects, Catholics of one shade of belief had persecuted Catholics of other shades of belief, and all of these had from time to time persecuted Jews. In efforts to force loyalty to whatever group happened to be on top, and in league with the government of a particular time and place, men and women had been fined, cast in jail, cruelly tortured, and killed. I think that's a major lesson from history, and it scares me.